So in this session, we're going to cover the feature selection and dimensionality reduction. Feature selection we will cover completely. Dimensionality reduction, one approach we will cover. One more we will cover in the next session. Okay. So, so far, let us see the syllabus that uh, yet to be covered. We have covered all the supervised learning methods, artificial neural networks approaches also we have covered. Right. What we left with is this uh, clustering, dimensional reduction, basically unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. So, in this session, we are covering dimensional reduction. Sir, recommendation system. Recommender systems also there, yes, yes. Recommender systems is there, but I will yes. give you a video of that, video recording of that. Okay. Why, sir, you will not tell. Uh, let us see if the time permits, I will only take. Otherwise, we can give the video recording. Sir, one, one request, sir. Uh, we in office, we have taken permission, sir, to attend this program. So we wanted on the certificate uh, from whatever the date is given as for the brochure. Yeah, yeah. You will get as per the browser. Continue till the syllabus. Uh... No, you will get according to the browser only. Okay. okay. Because officially that is the timing. This is for our convenience. We are adjusting this. Okay. Yes, sir. And one more thing, this videos will be available for how long, sir, duration? Uh, it is two, three weeks available. Okay. Two, After three, that, sorry, sir. After that also it may be available, but uh, I guarantee that it will be available till two, three weeks. Okay. You, sir. Mm -hmm. It could have final day, sir. Sir, what is it? It's past day, sir. Okay. So, uh, so what is uh, feature selection or the dimensionality reduction? So very simple. It is a problem of selecting some subset of the features. Right. So some subset of a learning algorithm input variables upon which it should focus attention while ignoring the rest of them. So in other words, we are trying to reduce the number of dimensions. Okay. But this is not only the way of reducing the dimensions. There is another way also, which is projecting the data to some lower dimensional space. So dimensionality reduction can be done in two ways. One is using the feature selection. It means we are ignoring some subset of the features and selecting the important features that are useful for the prediction. This is one possibility. The other possibility is projecting the data to some lower dimensional space without losing much information. This generally we call it as a dimensionality reduction. Right? So in the feature selection, we just ignore the features that are not contributing for the prediction. So do you remember I gave one example of predicting the grades of a student? So each student might have described with different features like what is student ID, student name, what is student height, student weight, what is his hair length, what is his color? Let's say I'm just taking some random features and how many hours he spent on studies, how many hours he attended classes. So all these are the different features that they we describe the student. But do you think all these features are important for the prediction of the grades? Oh, Not sir. at all, right? Only few features are important, they are relevant in the context of the grade prediction. While the rest of them are not at all relevant for the problem at hand. So we can ignore those features and select the subset of features that are useful for the prediction. So this we call it as a feature selection. And this feature selection can be done in many ways. So we'll be looking at uh, multiple possible ways of selecting these features. Okay, so all the feature selection techniques are categorized into three types. So before we're going to see that three types, why do we need this feature selection? Usually what we think more number of features means more information. It means more discriminating power. That's what we usually think, right? More number of features means more information. And if you have more information, it will, you will have the capability to discriminate the classes more in better way. Right, that's what we think. But usually that's not the case for so many reasons. Okay, so one reason is that there are so many features with many irrelevant and redundant features. Okay, so because of this irrelevant and redundant features, learners may confuse sometimes, right? The learning algorithms may confuse sometimes. And if by 
selecting the subset of edges it reduces the overfitting because less redundant data means less opportunity to make decisions based on the noise that's why it reduces the overfit the overfitting and it also improves the accuracy because less misleading data means model accuracy will improve it also reduces the training time because few when you are reducing the dimensions obviously algorithm complexity also depends on the number of dimensions so fewer data points reduce the i mean because of this fewer dimensions algorithm complexity is reduced therefore the algorithms train faster okay especially when you are dealing with the large number of variables there is a need for the dimensionality reduction okay so these are the reasons why we need this feature selection or the dimensionality reduction because it reduces the overfitting improves the accuracy reduces the training time all right <clears throat> and feature selection can significantly improve learning algorithms performance as well all right so this is what this is the curse of dimensionality we call it as generally or usually we think that number of features means more discriminating power therefore the performance will improve more right that's what we think usually you see but in practice till some point as you increase the number of dimensions the performance may increase but after some time after some uh, time uh, it will gradually decrease as you see here right so this we call it as a curse of dimensionality okay so the classifier performance usually will degrade for the large number of features okay fine so this is what we call it as a curse of dimensionality and because of that we need this dimensionality reduction technique right so it means we reduce the number of dimensions therefore algorithm performance will improve right so there are multiple ways of selecting the features so first we will be discussing about the feature selection then we will go to the dimensionality reduction dimensionality reduction means basically projecting the data to some lower dimensional space so first we will discuss the feature selection then we will move to the dimensionality reduction okay so feature selection techniques are broadly classified into three categories one is filter approaches filter approaches wrapper approaches second one is wrapper approaches the third one is embedded approaches we will see them one by one filter approaches wrapper approaches and embedded approaches right in the filter approaches we give the set of all the features as the input and then we select the best subset of features and this best subset of features are, will be given to the learning algorithm and then learn the model and evaluate the performance of the model so it means the selection of the best subset of feature is independent of the learning algorithm it doesn't matter whether the learning algorithm is svm or decision tree or logistic regression or something else it doesn't matter because the feature selection uh, is independent of the learning algorithm so irrespective of the learning algorithm there is a separate procedure to to select this best subset of the features okay so the selection of features is independent of any machine learning algorithm all right so basically what we do is that we find we perform some statistical analysis on the features right so let's say that let's say that uh, the student information only let us say so let us say there are uh, two features two features one is the number of hours the student spent for studies the second one is number of minutes that he spent for the studies let's say there are two features something like this aren't these two features redundant they are highly correlated to one another right as you increase one the other one will also strictly increase this am i right hello yes sir right or you can take height of a person in centimeters height of a person in meters are the redundant features yes hello? sir right so you, 
having redundant features means it is degrading the performance of the model so what this filter methods does is that they find out the correlation between the features so if the correlation value is very high then they will ignore one of this feature and keep the other feature right so this is one of the approach or the other kind of approaches are like it finds out the correlation between input variable and the corresponding output variable if the correlation value is very low it means this feature is not influencing the prediction it means you can ignore the corresponding feature so these are the two ways of ignoring the features or selecting the features either you can perform the correlation analysis between the features it means between the different input variables or you can perform correlation analysis between input and the output variables okay so whatever it is you are using this correlation analysis to ignore the features or to select the subset of the features okay so we call them as the filter approaches so we are just filtering out the filtering out the uh, redundant and relevant features redundant and the irrelevant features all right so to find out the correlation between the two variables depending on whether that is a continuous type or the uh, discrete type we have different correlation methods like for example if the input variable is continuous and the output variable is also continuous then sorry if the input variable is continuous and the output variable is also continuous we call that as a oh, sorry we use the pearson correlation so this we have already seen right pearson correlation do you remember we have computed correlation between the uh, what is the temperature and the ice cream sales do you remember that example yes sir okay so the pearson correlation we had used it there yes and if the input variable is continuous and the output variable is categorical we use the linear discriminant analysis for this uh, correlation whereas if the input variable is categorical output variable is continuous we can use the anova test if both of them are categorical we can use the chi square test okay so depending on the input and the output variable types we have different types of analysis and based on that we identify the correlation between them and we decide to whether uh, there is any relation between these two variables or not right it means is this relation due to the random chance probability or they are highly correlated to one another that's what the statistical analysis decides once you decide that you can take a decision of keeping the feature or ignoring the feature all right so these are the various methods based on correlation Sir, input is what, sir? Here, I mean this uh, uh, row, first row, first row is co continuous, ma sir. Second row is categorical. These are input, ma sir, and output are. Uh, I couldn't follow you, madam. Can you repeat? Sir, uh, sir, here row is where, sir? You write down on the table, no? Which? Yeah. Okay, the corner, wala, top left corner, this one. This is a feature, madam. This is a response. Okay. Okay, but it not is not necessary that you will be conducting this test between the input and the output variables only. You can also conduct between two input variables also. Okay. Okay. See, for example, I said that these two are the input variables: height in centimeter, height in meters. Suppose if I conduct a correlation between these two features and I found it to be a correlation value is very high, it means that they are redundant features. You can ignore one of them. Yes. And, right. So it means this correlation analysis can be performed on the two input variables also. Okay. Taking one of the one of the feature as the input variable, one of the another feature as the output variable. Okay. So that can also be done. Okay. Uh, on the whole you can perform this analysis between any two variables got it madam yes sir yeah so the next approach is wrapper methods so in the wrapper methods the wrapper method we are selecting the subset of features that maximizes the learning algorithm performance 
okay it means we give we select a subset so we give we select the one subset of the features from all the set of features and then we learn we train the learning algorithm and then we evaluate the learning algorithm performance on the validation data set and similarly we we pick up another subset give it to the learning algorithm learn the learning algorithm and evaluate the performance of the learning algorithm on the validation data set so this process repeat for the multiple times with respect to multiple subsets of the uh, whole feature set and pick up a subset that maximizes the performance okay so let me repeat it may be slightly confusing to you so let us say that you have five features 1 2 3 4 5 5 what are the possible subsets it can be 1 it can be 2 it can be 3 4 5 1 2 1 3 1 4 1 5 2 3 2 4 2 so on 1 2 3 4 2 3 4 5 1 3 4 5 many possible subsets are there right so pick up one subset of the features pick up one subset of the features from this pick up a subset of features using that subset of features train the learning algorithm train the learning algorithm and evaluate the performance of the learning algorithm based on uh, validation data set so validation data set evaluate the performance of the model with respect to the validation data set right so repeat the process with respect to multiple subsets and pick up the subset that maximizes the performance so this means what subset selection is depending on the learning algorithm performance hello am i right yes so sir if you look at the previous one it is independent of the machine learning algorithm that you are picking but here it is depending on the machine learning algorithm that you are picking right so there are different ways of selecting the subset because uh, you can't select all the uh, exponential number of subsets how many subsets are possible if you have five features 2 power 5 to 2 power 5 right right so 1 2 3 4 5 5 individual subsets it can be 1 2 1 3 so on it can be 4 5 and all the three combinations 1 2 3 1 2 4 so on 3 4 5 5 okay so 1 2 3 4 1 2 4 5 5 and so on 3 4 2 3 4 5 5 5 okay and finally 1 2 3 4 5 5 these are all the possible subsets so this is 2 to the power 5 minus 1 right so these many subsets are the possible right so it means this is of exponential time right this is of exponential time complexity if you check each and every possible subset right so to avoid this exponential time complexity we follow some kind of greedy approach so different ways of selecting the subsets in a greedy approach are forward selection backward elimination and recursive feature elimination okay so this recursive feature elimination is also a kind of backward elimination only some special case of that so let us see what is the idea behind forward selection backward elimination and recursive feature elimination okay so we initially check the performance of the model with respect to each and every feature feature 1 feature 2 feature 3 feature 4 and feature 5 right and pick up a feature that maximizes the learning algorithm performance with respect to the validation data set okay it means train the model with a feature 1 train the model with a feature 2 and evaluate the performance of the model with respect to the validation data set train the model with respect to feature 2 and evaluate the learning algorithm performance with respect to the validation data set and train the algorithm using the feature 3 and evaluate the learning algorithm performance using the validation data set and repeat the process for all the individual features so pick up a feature that maximizes the learning algorithm feature so let that feature is 3 okay so let that feature is 
Now at the next level, we will generate only the combinations with the three. It means all the supersets of three will be generated. So what are the possible supersets of three? Three one, three two, three four, and three five. These are the possible subsets with the combination of third feature. Am I right? Hello, following? Yes, sir. Everybody, following? Yes, sir. Yeah. Not not many responses. Could you follow or not? Gita, madam. Yes, sir. Parmesha, sir. Ravi, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So now again, do the same thing. Try the algorithm with respect to this subset of features. Evaluate the learning algorithm performance. Try the algorithm with respect to this subset of features and evaluate the learning algorithm performance and so forth. Again, pick up the subset that maximizes the learning algorithm performance. So let that is three one. So three one. Let's say three one is maximizing the learning algorithm's performance. Now generate all the supersets of three one. So what are the possible supersets of three one? Three one two, three one four, and three one five. Okay, and repeat the same process. Le learn the algorithm uh, with a subset of which is three one two. Evaluate the learning algorithm performance. And build the model using the subset of which is three one four, and learn uh, evaluate the learning algorithm performance, and so forth. Okay, and pick up a best subset of the features, and let that is three one five. So every time when you are picking the best subset among the possible subsets at that level, one more condition you need to check: is the performance improving as compared to the previous level or not? Okay, suppose let's say here it is ninety percent accuracy, the learning algorithm performance. Three one five is best among these three, but we have got only eighty five percent. So which subset should I take? Three one or three one five? Three one. Three one only, right? So it means at any point, if the algorithm performance at the previous level. Is better than algorithm performance at the current level. We stop the algorithm and declare the subset as the best evaluating best perform subset that gives the best performance at the previous level. So this is the algorithm. Very simple. So let me repeat the algorithm one more time. So initially we learn the algorithm or build the algorithm with the individual features, right? So it means subset of features we are picking as the individual features. Right, and we then evaluate the performance of the model with respect to each and every feature, and we pick up a feature that maximizes the learning algorithm performance. And once you select that, we select the sup all the supersets of that feature. Like for example, here, the feature three is the opt optimizing the performance of the learning algorithm. Now we see that is there any combination of three one. That maximize um, combination with three that maximizes the learning algorithm performance. So generate all the possible combinations with three, all the supersets of three, three one, three two, three four, three five, etc. And then build the algorithm with each which of the subsets and evaluate the learning algorithm performance and pick up the subset that maximizes the performance. So repeat the process until convergence. And the convergence condition is at any level. If the learning algorithm performance, the best performance at that level is less than the best performance at the previous level, then stop the algorithm and declare the subset of the features. Okay, clear? Algorithm is clear. Everybody? Yes. 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 Okay. So recursive feature elimination. This is the reverse of this. Even the backward elimination is also the same. Okay. So backward elimination. What we do is that we start with all the features initially, right? And we eliminate one feature at a time. So let's say that there are five features: one, two, three, four, five. So evaluate the performance with respect to each and every feature, and eliminate the feature that minimizes the performance. Eliminate the feature that minimizes the performance. So it means 
so let us say if one uh, one is uh, evaluate the performance with respect to each and every feature and then uh, eliminate a feature that minimizes the performance so repeat the process uh, until convergence Con convergence condition is same so at any level if the learning algorithm performance is lesser than the algorithm performance at the previous level we stop the algorithm so recursive feature elimination is also similar so here initially we start with all the features all the features one two three four five fine and we evaluate the performance eliminate one feature at a time and then evaluate the learning algorithm performance with respect to the rest of the features so here five is eliminated here two is eliminated here one is eliminated here four is eliminated so we are eliminating one feature at a time and evaluating the learning algorithm performance right so select the best subset that maximizes the performance right similarly so let's say this is the best subset now again repeat the process eliminate one feature at a time remove two remove three remove four remove five one at a time and rest of the features with respect to the rest of the features you evaluate the learning algorithm performance so repeat the process until convergence suppose here the learning algorithm performance is 90 percent here you have got it to be 85 percent only so because the learning algorithm performance is reducing after eliminating these features we stop the algorithm and declare the subset as this okay so to summarize this wrapper approaches what we are doing in wrapper approaches is that we are picking one subset of the feature with respect to that subset we are evaluating the learning algorithm performance with respect to the validation data set okay so then we modify the subset and then evaluate the performance of the model so this process is repeated until we select the best subset of the features so once we select the best subset of the feature we train the model and evaluate the learning algorithm performance on uh, this best subset of the features with respect to the train, uh, test data okay so is it clear A wrapper method idea that's what is given in the figure generate a subset learning algorithm generate a subset this process is repeated multiple times and then get the best subset and then evaluate the performance of the model clear yes have you understood the difference between the filter approaches and the wrapper approaches what is the difference sir what sir. is the difference between filter and so backward wrapper? back backward elimination backward elimination is also a kind of recursive only madam but there here we are evaluating the performance with respect to uh, see for example here you are eliminating you. one feature and evaluating the performance with respect to the rest of the features no madam yes okay. sir so uh, this is a backward elimination is a special case wherein we evaluate the performance with respect to the individual features with respect to feature 1 feature 2 feature 3 feature 4 feature 5 and eliminate the feature that minimizes the performance okay, okay. okay. in many if you see the literature no madam at many places they have used this backward elimination and recursive feature elimination interchangeably at many places but i found this a difference a slight difference at some resource okay but you may not be able to locate also this one even i couldn't locate later when i was trying to search it like but I, in one line we should remove that feature which in backward the one which is performing low lowest yes 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 that's what the difference that i found at some resource okay that and i couldn't locate it later also yes that's what i found but uh, Yes, backward elimination and recursive feature elimination are used interchangeably at many look, many places. Okay, but this is a slight difference between them. But the idea behind both of them is same. At a time, you are eliminating one feature. Right. the The way that you evaluate may be different. Maybe in this, you are picking up a best subset that maximizes the performance. In that, you may be eliminating a feature that minimizes the performance. But whatever it is, you're eliminating one feature, no? Isn't it? You're starting with the yes. whole set of features and eliminating one feature at a time. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yeah. 
yes yes madam sir in the previous slide are we going to compare only in one level sir or to the previous level also we are comparing sir previous because one also we have to compare because we should ensure that it if it is increasing only i mean if the learning algorithm performance is increasing only we'll proceed further otherwise we, there is no point proceeding no in that case sir if, if as you showed it is given 90 in the four and in the three features it is giving 85 no sir in that case uh, so it is decreasing we stop the algorithm and declare the best subset as a 2345 okay sir okay so what is the difference between filter and the wrapper approaches what is the difference between filter and the wrapper approaches filter we are filtering based on the statistical uh, uh, information so it means we are not using the learning algorithm yes. performance it means they are independent of yes. the learning algorithm yes whereas here in case of wrapper approaches it does dependent on the yes. learning algorithm okay, so but uh, adapting this uh, wrapper one uh, uh, are uh, time intensive intensive no because time intensive yes because every time you have to train the model so the training the model with respect to one particular subset takes time so it means you are training the model with respect to the multiple subsets that is computationally more intensive as compared to the filter approaches right so the filter approaches are much faster in terms of the time complexity but performance wise if you see you, you may not get the best subset of the features even in wrapper methods also you cannot guarantee but slightly better because you are Uh, although you are following the grade a approach it is uh, uh, you are ensuring that you are picking the best subset among the ones that you have checked okay and there is no way of checking in case of filter approaches right you are just eliminating or uh, ignoring some of the features right and selecting the rest of the features each one of them has their advantages and disadvantages filter approaches are faster but they may not select the best subset of the features wrapper methods are time intensive but there is a higher chance of selecting the best subset of the features clear ma'am shall we move on yes sir <clears throat> so the next one is the embedded methods so in the embedded methods this feature selection mechanism is in built okay so it means you need not explicitly define anything okay so this feature selection mechanism is inbuilt for them so let me take an example of the lesser regression we have already discussed this while discussing the lesser regression let us recollect again so lesser regression do you remember this lesser regression yes When sir you are we were uh, trying to convert the two points no yes so this is l1 norm right it is applying l1 norm so according to this objective of minimizing the squared difference between actual and the predicted values we are interested in going to this point this is the optimal point according to the first objective the second objective is to minimize the error uh, minimize this weights or the parameters right to avoid the overfitting problem or penalize the weights that contribute to high variance right So according to this objective we want to minimize w which is this the optimal point is this so according to the first objective the optimal point is this according to the second objective the optimal point is this so both of them are not same therefore we look for the intersecting point where both the objectives meet and this is the intersecting point where both the objectives are meeting right so tell me what is the value of w1 at this point what is the value of w1 at that point zero zero w1 is zero and our model is what w0 plus w1 x1 in our notations it was theta not theta one so on and same as that w1 x1 w2 x2 and so on right so now when w1 equal to zero are we considering the corresponding feature are we considering the corresponding feature x1 hello when w1 equal to 0 are we considering the corresponding feature x1 in this model 
No, sir. We are not considering that. It becoming zero. When you multiply x1 with zero, what will happen? We'll get zero only, right? It means yes. you are not giving any importance to x1. You are completely ignoring that feature. It means this lesser regression has the inbuilt feature selection mechanism that automatically ignores the features that are not useful for the prediction. Right? Understood, right? The concept of the embedded methods. So they have the inbuilt feature selection mechanism and they automatically ignore the features that are not contributing for the prediction. And it selects the features that are important for the prediction. Clear? The concept of the embedded methods? Yes. Okay. So the feature selection can be done in one of the three possible ways. Filter approaches, wrapper approaches, and the embedded approaches. So what is the difference between filter and the wrapper approaches? Okay. So in the case of filter approaches, okay, your relevance of the, we measure the relevance of the features by their correlation with the dependent variable. While in the wrapper methods, we measure the usefulness of the subset of the features by actually training a model on it. Then it means in the filter approaches, we are, we are selecting the subset of the features independent of the machine learning algorithm. Whereas in case of wrapper approaches, we are selecting the subset of the features that maximizes the learning algorithm performance. It means we are actually training them, uh, training the model on that subset, right? So therefore, filter approaches are much faster as compared to the wrapper approaches. Right. On the other hand, wrapper approaches are computationally very expensive because we have to train them every time. Okay. So whereas filter approaches uses some statistical methods for evaluation of the subset of the features, while the wrapper approaches use the cross validation in a sense that every time it builds the model and then evaluate the performance with respect to the validation data set. Okay. So the filter approaches might fail to find out the best subset of the feature in many occasions. But wrapper approaches can provide a best subset of features in many cases, right? And using the subset of features from the wrapper method make the model more prone to the overfitting because you are every time you are checking with respect to the training data and then evaluating the performance, right? There is a chance of overfitting in case of wrapper approaches. So these are the differences between the filter and the wrapper approaches. So that's all about the feature selection. So if you have any queries, I can take. Otherwise, we'll move to the principal component analysis quickly. Clear three methods, filter approaches, wrapper methods, and the embedded methods. The idea is clear, right? Yes, yes. the embedded method are that widely uh... Adopted so. Uh, embedded method. method is embedded, embedded method is that widely adopted by the investigators. Or oh, these two only we get to see most of the time. Uh -huh. It depends, madam. It depends on the requirements also. Okay. Yeah. See, suppose if you uh, embedded methods, of course, they are used. Uh, widely as you said, right? But the filter method approaches also they use in some cases where they quickly want to uh, do some pre-processing on the data, right? Because the other methods takes a lot of time to judge that, right? To ignore the features, right? Whereas the filter methods can quickly, or sometimes it is hybrid also. Initially, you quickly ignore some of the features, okay? By setting up some threshold by doing some pre-processing, then go for the wrapper methods or the um, or the embedded methods that say that is that also saves a lot of time. Okay, you can even go for the hybrid approaches also. Uh, is that okay, ma'am? Are you okay. following? Yes, yeah. The next one is the principal component analysis. So basically here, Principal component analysis has got lots of applications. One of the application is this dimensionality reduction. So the idea is very simple. We are just trying to project the data to some lower dimensional space without losing much information. 
that's what the idea that we're going to execute right how it projects in which direction it projects all that we will see as we proceed these are the different applications of pca data visualization or presentation data compression noise reduction data classification trend analysis factor analysis and so forth various applications of pca so we'll see that data so let's say there is a data of uh, blood and urine measurements so this example is having 53 blood and urine measurements from 65 people okay and out of the 65 people 30 of them are alcoholic and 32 of them are non alcoholic so you see that each sample because uh, 53 measurements is too big to present in the slide we have given very few measurements here as you see there white blood cell count red blood cell count hemoglobin all this right you see that right so different features fine so there are different ways of presenting this right so there are 65 people each each person can get one spectral format one curve in this but this looks very clumsy there is no information that you can get or you can make out of this figure or graph right you can do this kind of analysis like you can see the distribution of this one particular widget then h band i mean how how different persons are distributed according to this particular widget or you can see the distribution of the people according to the two variables or two two features right or you can see the distribution of the people according to the three features but you can't go beyond that visually you can only visualize three dimensions right you can't visualize more than that okay right at least physically you cannot visualize conceptually you may visualize but physically you cannot visualize more than three dimensions all right so can we have a better presentation than the ordinate axis is the question and from there this principal component analysis is evaluated okay it means if you have the 53 dimensional space do we need 53 dimensional space to view the data it's not possible though yes yes sir so how to find the best low dimensional space that conveys maximum useful information is the question that the principal component analysis is addressing okay so how to find out the best low dimensional space that conveys maximum useful information is the question that this principal component analysis is addressing. So we look for the principal components that preserve most of the useful information, right? While projecting the data onto some lower dimensional space. All right. So we'll see that. So the principal component analysis converts the original data matrix with n instances and p dimensions so this is the original data of n instances and the p dimensions so it means in the original data set we have p dimensions so this is converted to an n by x n by k matrix it means the number of dimensions you are reducing from p to k okay it means you are projecting the p dimensional data onto k dimensional data so this k are k is the first k principal components of the data so the first k component display as much information as possible uh, to indicate the variation among the objects so it means this principal component analysis projecting the data onto lower dimension in such a way that it maximizes the variance and minimizes the error that means when it is projecting the data onto lower dimensional space it is maximizing the variance in the lower dimensional space and at the same time it is minimizing the difference between actual data point and the projected data point also okay that we will see with an example so uh, before i explain this figure just tell me that uh, I give you two data sets, data set D1 and data set D2. Which one of this has got more variance? Hmm? 
Which one? Data one. D one. D one. D one. Okay, I give you one more example. This is a one-dimensional data. The data points are distributed like this. There is another dimension. Okay, this is one data set. Let's say. There is another data set A two. Something like this. Data points are distributed like this on one axis only. So, which one of this has got more variance, D one or D two? D one. D one. Right, because the spread of the data points is more in case of day one, whereas the spread of the data points is less in case of day two. Okay, so now coming back to this objective of the principal component analysis, what principal component analysis does is that it rigidly rotates the axis of p-dimensional space to new positions, right? Such that it has got following properties, right? Properties are two. It orders the principal axis one as the highest variance, principal axis two as the next highest variance, and so forth. Okay, and covariance among each pair of the principal axis is zero. Okay, so this may look, I mean, not so clear, but let me explain you this with an with the help of example. So this is an example of the two-dimensional data, and the points are indicated with a blue color in the figure. This is how they are distributed according to these two dimensions. Let's say x one and x two. Now we want to project this data onto one-dimensional data. So let's say I just want to project the data to some one-dimensional space. This is a two-dimensional data. I want to project it into a two-dimensional space. Sorry, one-dimensional space. Okay. <clears throat> now rigidly rotate this axis or select this projection. In such a way that the variance between the points is maximized in the projected space and error is minimized. It means you select the direction when you are projecting the data onto lower dimensional space. Which direction is referred is the question. Which direction is referred? This direction or this direction or this direction? Which direction is referred? You want to project the data to one dimensional. Which direction should I proceed? Well, should, should I project? Is the question. So, what this principal component analysis is saying that project onto a direction where the variance is maximized and the error is minimized. Okay. So, observe it carefully. Tell me that there are two principal components and each one of them are orthogonal to one another. Right. So it means you see that two principal components, as you see there, that uh, the one that is rotating, there are two principal components. This is one principal component. This is another principal component. I mean, another direction. They are orthogonal to one another. So which direction variance is maximized and error is minimized? You pick up that direction. You pick up a direction that maximizes the variance and minimizes the error. Tell me. Which direction the variance is maximized in the projected space? This direction or this direction? Direction one, direction two. Suppose if I project the data onto direction one, the points are spread something like this, as you see in this data set D1. Hello, am I right? Points will be spread across this line, something like this. Yes, sir. If I project the data onto D2, all will be projected within this gap. Within this gap, right? So within this gap, everything will be projected. So it means the data looks something like this, right? Mm. So which one of these projections has got more variance? Projection one or projection two? Projection two. Projection two. Projection two. More variance. I'm variance not... projection one. But yes. error is where D two is error is less. More points are lying on the error is also. Uh, less in the direction one only that we will come to that point later. Don't worry about the terror for now. Just let me know that in which direction if I project variance will be maximized in the projected space. Direction one or direction two? Direction two. 
So we did not see the points in the uh, points. Where did you plot, sir, for D1? Direction one, I think. Madam, these are, see, here, because I don't have multiple colors, you know, uh, I don't know how, to, let me, okay, here it is. Let me pick up a color. You are confused with that animation which is taking place, no, sir, behind that D1, D2. Somewhere else can we draw this? Give me a second, madam. Okay. Yeah. So these are the data points, madam. This one, this one, this one, this one. Okay. So these are the data points. So you project the data onto some lower dimensional space where the variance is maximized and the error is minimized. Okay. So you look at this top right side figure that is rotating. So now, or this one, which is the same. So now if I project the data onto this direction, direction one, the points will be spread like this, right? Like this. Hello, madam, points are spread in this, in this gap, right? From here to here. Am I right, madam? Yes, sir. Right. Whereas if I project the points onto direction D2, spread of the points are within this gap only. Yes, sir. Right. So which direction variance is more? Direction 1 or direction 2? Direction 1. Direction 1 variance is more. Am I right, everybody? Yes. Agree? Right. So we, what we are saying according to the principal component analysis, project the data onto lower dimensional space where the variance is maximized and the error is minimized. And what is the error? Error is the difference between actual data point and the projected data point. So which direction error is minimized? Observe carefully and tell me. Uh, let me arrange this. Uh, which direction error is minimized? Direction 1 or direction 2? This is direction 1. This is direction 2. It is not stopping only, sir. <laughs> no, you just... You see, yes, yes. Direction 1, sir. Direction one only, right? You see that that red yes, color yes. lines, thin stretch. red color lines. In D two direction, the points are getting stressed or they're going away. Yes, yes, exactly. You see that you can observe that with the thin red color lines that you see, that indicates the error. If the line is larger, means the error is more. The line is shorter, means the error is less. See, say that. Please observe in which direction when this line comes that red color thin lines are shorter. In this one only. The line is coinciding with the D1. It is coinciding with D1. the D1, right? Yes. So this is the direction of the maximum variance and the minimum error, right? And we are interested in finding such direction. Okay. So we are trying to find out the orthogonal projection of the data onto some lower dimensional linear space that maximizes the variance of the projected data, which is indicated with the purple color line in this figure, and minimizes the mean square distance between the data points and the projections. That means some of the differences between the actual and the uh, projected data points indicated with the blue colors in the figure, right? That is what the objective of the principal component analysis, okay? So the idea is very simple. Given the data points in the d-dimensional space, project the data onto lower dimensional space while preserving as much information as possible. Okay, so in particular, choose the projection that minimizes the squared error while reconstructing the original data. That's what the idea. So we'll see the algorithm, we'll see the example, then we will wind up the session. Very simple, 
very easy algorithm. So one slide previous one second. Previous slide. One more. Just no 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 earlier sir green one. Forward forward forward. Okay, so this is the algorithm. We are given input matrix, data matrix X, and we are also given K, where K is the number of dimensions onto which we want to project. It means we want to reduce the data to K dimensions. It means we identify the top eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. All right. So the first step is to find out the mean mean of each and every column, each and every dimension, right? Once you identify the mean, subtract the mean from each and every element in that column. Okay, subtract the mean from each and every element in that column or dimension. So once you subtract the mean, take the covariance of the matrix, right? So X transpose X you take, right? So this is the covariance of the matrix. Now compute the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of this covariance matrix sigma. Okay, and then order this uh, eigenvalues and the eigenvectors according to the according to their values in the decreasing order, right? And then return the top k eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. These are the top k principal components or the directions where the variance is maximized and the error is minimized. Okay. So let us see an example and then come back to this algorithm one more time. Then you will understand it better. This is an example. So this, so this is an example. This is step one. Subtract the mean. Subtract the mean. It means we have to compute the mean, right? So this is the data. There are two dimensions, x dimension and y dimension. Compute the mean of x dimension. Compute the mean of the y dimension, right? So here X minus X bar, Y minus Y bar, you compute. So this is the zero mean data, which means data after subtracting the mean. Clear? Step one is clear, right? Step one is subtract the mean. Yes, sir. From the yes. Data, right. This is a zero mean data, we call it as. So now second, uh, next step, right, this is the zero mean data. So next step is calculate the covariance matrix of this zero mean data. So how many dimensions are there? Two dimensions are there, two variables are there. So what is the size of the covariance matrix? Size of the covariance matrix is two by two, right? So this is X, X, Y, Y, right? So this is the covariance between X and Y. This is the covariance between Y and X. Both of them are same, you see that. And this is the variance of X and this is the variance of Y. Okay, so here the non-diagonal elements in this covariance matrix are positive. You see that this and this are positive. So we should expect both X and Y variables increase together as this is positive. That's what it means, right? Covariance is positive means what? They're positively varying with one another, right? Fine, so once you compute the covariance matrix, Find out the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. Eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. All right. So these are the eigenvalues and these are the corresponding eigenvectors. This is the eigenvector one. This is the eigenvector two. Okay. So now we need to sort them based on their eigenvalues. So which is the highest eigenvalue? 1.28 is the highest eigenvalue. And what is the eigenvector corresponding to that? This one. It means? Minus 0. 0.67787. Uh, yeah. So this is the eigenvector corresponding to that. So you bring that to the first, first column, right? Means you have to sort these eigenvectors according to their eigenvalues in the decreasing order. All right. Uh, so, sir, sir, we need to do this for every variable, sir. Every feature, ka, uh, between every feature and then uh, target variable, the covariance matrix. 
no covariance matrix is of size uh, um, i mean this you are doing it for only the uh, you are not considering the target value madam please observe that only features only you are considering it is independent of the it is a kind of unsupervised learning only it is not using any label information here no you because computing the got like that sir see nahi nahi because that we have said x and y might be why you thought it as a target variable but yes, it is actually yes. not both of them are the features only okay so you are computing the covariance between all the pairs of features madam it means if there are d features that's what i was asking sir covariance if there are d features covariance matrix will be of size d by d madam where ij entry indicates covariance between feature i and feature j got it madam that's what we said here right this is the covariance between variable x and variable y feature x and feature y or you can say x1 x2 yes that sounds right because in that slide it is given like that okay x2 fine uh, clear ma'am now is it okay yes sir yeah so if you plot this no the principal components that we got this is the principal component corresponding to this highest eigen value corresponding vector okay and this is the principal component corresponding to the lowest eigen value corresponding eigen vector okay so which is capturing the pattern more better or which is maximizing the variance and minimizing the error this one right the highest value eigen vector right right so now this is the eigen values and the eigen vectors to reduce the number of features okay to reduce the number of features i'll come back to this slide later because you may know you may confuse now okay so now you just sort them based on their eigen values you see that this is the eigen vector corresponding to the highest eigen value this is the eigen vector corresponding to the next eigen value suppose at this point of time you decided to project the data onto one dimensional data right one dimensional space only so just pick up the first eigen vector after sorting suppose if you decided to pick up uh, decided to project the data onto k dimensions then pick up the first k principal components are the eigen vectors corresponding to the highest k eigen values right got my point right here there are only two dimensions that is why you are projecting it to one dimension but let us say that there are uh, 10 dimensions and you want to project it into four dimensions in that case we have to pick up first four eigen vectors after sorting them based on their eigen values got my point right hello got my point i should i repeat so it is very simple let me repeat the whole process one more time the first step what are you doing subtract the mean you will get a zero mean data tarvata uh, next you compute the covariance covariance sigma which is of size d by d now compute the eigen values and the eigen vectors of this covariance matrix compute eigen values and the eigen vectors okay and fourth step sort them based on their eigen values sort the eigen vectors based on their eigen values okay till this point is it clear everybody yes sir yes sir okay so now after sorting these eigen vectors based on their eigen values just pick up the top k eigen vectors where k is the number of dimensions onto which you want to project okay so pick up top k eigen vectors pick up top k eigen vectors 
So here k is one. That is why I'm just picking up only one. Okay. So now how to get the projected data is the question. Once you get this eigen vector, how to get the projected data? Okay. So for that, to get the final data, multiply row feature vector with the row zero mean data. Row zero mean data means transpose of the zero mean data. So do you remember the zero mean data, which is of size n by two? Hello, n by two only, right? Where n is the number of instances, two are the two dimensions, x and y. So if you don't remember, I'll go back to this slide. This one. What is the size of this? 10 cross 2, right? Some n. So maybe 10 points are there. How many are there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 points are there. n is equal to 10. This is of size n by 2 only. No. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah. So now row, this is zero mean data, which is of size n by 2. Row zero mean data means transpose of this. What will be the size of that? 2 by n. 2 by n. So row 0 mean data size would be 2 by n. Okay. And row feature vector. Row feature vector is the matrix with the eigenvectors. Okay. Matrix with the eigenvectors. So what is this? Feature vector. The feature vector is this, which is of size 2 by 1. What is the row feature vector? Transpose of this. What will be the size of that? 1 by 2. 1 by 2. So what will you get if you multiply 1 by 2 with 2 by n? 1 by n. 1 by n. 1 cross n. Take the transpose of this. Yes. What will you get? n, n by, by 1. Which is the projected data or the final data. Okay. So it means once you get or pick up the top k feature vectors corresponding to the top k eigenvalues, take the transpose of them, multiply it with the transpose of the zero mean data. Then you will get the final data in terms of rows. If you want to get it in terms of the columns, take the transpose again. Got it? So in this example, you're multiplying this with that transpose of the row zero mean data to get the final data. Okay. So it means when you multiply this with the corresponding values, if you pick up both the eigenvectors, you will get these two columns. If you pick up only one, uh, only one eigenvector, you will get only one column, which is n by n by one you will be getting. So which is the projected data in the one dimensional space. All right. So that is what very simple process. Okay, so I understand that you one point is not clear to you, most of you. Once you find out the eigenvectors, how to get the final data or the projected data. That's what is running your mind, right? Shall I repeat that point? Or do you got it? Hello, should I repeat that point? Everybody, please let me know. Have you understood till this point? Yes. Once again. Yes, but you told, sir, sir, covariance matrix which we are doing between the variable variables, you told the size is d by d. D by d, yes. Hmm? So that d is no, nothing but. Uh... D by d, madam. But when you see, this is a covariance. D is the number of dimensions, madam. Don't oh, worry. Yes. D is the number of dimensions or the number of attributes. So once you are getting the covariance between them, compute the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of that. Okay. So once you compute the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, just sort them based on their eigenvalues. So this is what you get. This is the highest value correspond highest eigenvalue corresponding eigenvector. This is the next highest value, highest eigenvalue corresponding eigenvector, and so forth. Okay, so now if you want to project the data to k dimensions, just pick the top k eigenvectors. Okay, just pick up the top k eigenvectors. Just pick up the top k eigenvectors. So here we are picking the top one eigenvector. Top one eigenvector, which is of size 2 by 1. 
now you are taking the transpose of this 1 by 2 right so multiplying this with transpose of the zero, row zero min data zero min data size is n by 2 transpose if you take that is 2 by 10 so when you multiply them you will get 1 by 10 it means one dimensional data 10 points isn't it that's what you got hello yes that's the final data right yes, sir, yes. Or if you take the transpose of this you will get 10 by 1 similarly if you take k eigenvectors here this will be k by 2 2 by times 2 by 10 right so this will be k times 10 it means you are getting the data onto k dimensions that's all so if you pick one it will be 2 by 1 right if you pick k it will be 2 by k i mean not 2 whatever is the number of features or d by k d by k right right so that's what it's very simple So this is the projected data after multiplying that with that. So any query you can ask. Procedure is this one. Now let us go back to this algorithm. Okay. So take the mean. Subtract the mean from X. This is the row zero mean data. Row zero mean data. Here you are getting zero, row zero mean data. Now, using this row zero mean data, compute the covariance. X transpose X. Find out the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors and then sort them. Okay, based on sort the eigenvectors based on their eigenvalues. Highest first. Okay, decreasing order, we have to sort them. And then pick up the top K principal components or the eigenvectors. And we make use of them to project the data to lower dimensional space. It means we are projecting the data to top k principal components or the eigenvectors. Okay. So where the variance is maximized and the error is minimized. So how are we saying the variance is maximized? That magnitude is given to the through the eigenvalues. That's why we are picking up the eigenvalues, highest eigenvalue corresponding eigenvectors. Okay. So because in that direction, variance will be maximized. That's what the information this eigenvalue is giving. Eigenvalue highest means what? The variance is highest in that direction. That is why we are picking up the eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue, highest eigenvalues. Got the intuition, right? Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So please feel free to say anything that if you don't under, if you didn't understand something just directly say that we didn't understand explain it in different words i will explain but don't please don't make silence eigen vector value we are getting is after that we are multiplying that only sir. see that is to get the projection madam but see to get the projected data what we do we multiply that suppose let's say that there is a point x there is a vector direction. There is a vector whose direction is given with V. Okay. Suppose if I want to project this X to this vector, this line whose direction is given by a vector V. What should I do? I multiply V transpose with X to project at data point. So this is basically what is giving is that the distance between the origin to this projected point. This is what this is giving. It means this is giving you the one dimensional projection of X onto B. So to get this projection only we are multiplying them here like the way we are multiplying V transpose X. You know, there we are multiplying eigenvectors with the X to get the projected data. That's all. Got it madam? Yes sir. Yes sir. Any other query? Clear? So shall we summarize the steps? Tell me what is the first step? I'll remove this algorithm. Okay. Okay. What is the first step? Compute the mean. Find the mean. Uh, mean. Second step. Subtract the mean. Zero subtract, mean. Uh, subtract the mean from the X. You will get a zero mean data. Right. So let us X is a zero mean data. Now compute the, what is the next, uh, third step? 
Covariance. Covariance. Sigma equal to x transpose x. Fourth step. Find out what we have to find out. Eigen values. Eigen, eigen, values. eigen values and eigen vectors of this covariance matrix sigma. Fifth step. Sort them based on the eigen values. Sort the eigen vectors based on their eigen values. Okay. And what next? Pick up. Split the values. Pick up top k eigen vectors. Okay. So use this top k eigen vectors, multiply it with the data, you will get the projected data. Clear? So all these steps are clear, right? Any confusion? One answer I'm expecting. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So any so confusion, please so let me know. Step sir. one sigma equal to x transport x. This sigma is doing what, sir? Nee, this is the covariance computation, madam. See, what is the covariance formula? You should you should correlate, madam. See. What is the <laughs> covariance formula? Covariance of x comma y is what? Do you remember? Expectation of x minus e of x by total times y minus e of y. Am I right? Hello, madam. Covariance of x comma y. What is it? x minus e of x times y minus e of y. Expectation of that. Am I right, madam? Do you remember? Do you remember in the probability class we have discussed covariance of x comma y? Achha, achha. Achha, achha. Okay. What, what is that expectation of x minus e of x times y minus e of y? Am I right, madam? It means what? You are subtracting average value from each and every x value, average value of y from each and every value. That's what you are computing in case of zero mean data, right? Once you yes. get that, you are taking the product of that x transpose okay. x to get the covariance between them. That's what it is doing yes. for all the possible values of x and y. Got it, madam? So yes. You take the x transpose x. What you are multiplying? You are multiplying that row with the corresponding column, right? It means when it is the let's say uh, feature 1, feature 2, feature 3, feature 4. So, when you are multiplying this with this, what are you multiplying actually? You are multiplying uh, the corresponding dimensions in the x and y. I mean, you, you consider it this madam. Like, for example, if there are d dimensions, let's say x1, x2, x3, so on, xd. When you take the zero mean data and then take the transpose of that, multiply it with this x transpose x, what you are getting is that you are getting the covariance between each and every possible pair of these dimensions or the attributes. Okay. So that's what is basically internally it is taking care of this equation, madam, when you take the x transpose x of the covariance matrix. Sorry, uh, x transpose x of the zero mean data. Okay, you can check it, expand it, check it. You will you will get the same. So when you take x transpose x, where x is the zero mean data, it means after subtracting the mean from each and every element, if you multiply x transpose x, this is what you are doing, madam, internally. Got okay. it, madam? Okay. Okay. Uh, should I elaborate it and uh, write uh, example also? Are no, no, sir. Yeah. Okay, sir. Okay. I'll 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 I'm just asking that uh, whether you have you could follow it or not. I'm not joking. Yeah. Where uh, we are reducing the dimensions. Huh? Where we are reducing the dimensions? Any query? Uh, you're asking where we are reducing the dimensions. Uh, yes, sir. See, madam, after sorting this uh, eigenvectors, no? These eigenvectors are like the principal components, madam. You are sorting them based on their eigenvalues, right? So the highest eigenvalue corresponding eigenvector comes first. The next highest eigenvalue corresponding eigenvector comes next and so on. So when you are picking up the top k eigenvectors, you're just projecting the data to 
k vectors k principal components so here for example i just picked up the top one eigen vector madam it means i'm just trying to project the data to one dimension whereas the given data is of two dimensions okay so i'm picking the top uh, top one eigen vector multiplying the zero mean data with this data then i will get the projected data which is of one dimension which is 1 by 10 means it is one dimension got it madam so here we are reducing the dimensions so by picking the top k eigen vectors you are projecting the data to top k principal components madam so if k is 2 you are projecting the data to two dimensions if k equal to 3 you are projecting the data to three dimensions it means the number of uh, number of dimensions onto which you are projecting is decided by this k value it means the top eigen top k eigen vectors that you are picking so if your k is 2 it means you are picking the top two eigen vectors and you are projecting the data to this top two eigen vectors or principal components So if the k value is three, it means you are picking the top three eigen vectors, and you are projecting the data to these three eigen vectors are the principal components. Clear, madam? Madam, is that yes, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah. Anybody else? Clear. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, clear. Clear, clear, yeah. sir. Okay. Uh, everybody else. Uh, Ramya, madam, is not there today. Ramya, madam. Sir, you are telling we are picking up top K, and that's an example. Uh, you wrote uh, n by one. Madam, here we are picking only one vector, madam, eigen vector. Where is n by one? See here also it is there no so on the slide ten by one. Ah uh ha. -huh. See this ten is the number of instances, madam. So that then fine so that yeah that are number inst of instances. Here ten is the number of instances. Two is the number of dimensions. So even vector will give us the idea about what is the dimension. Uh, how how many dimensions we have finalized to consider. For the projection of these n values, like whether we are considering three dimension or Pro projection of the k, uh, sorry, um, d values. Initially, d dimensions are there, right? You are reducing yes, them yes. to k dimensions. Right? Yes, yes, yes. Or initially, I think in the slide the notation given was p. P and d are we are using interchangeably. Basically, original set of dimensions you are projecting it into k dimensions. So here, if the k value is one, it means you are picking, you are projecting the data to one dimension. Okay. So basically, this will be of size d by d, madam. Okay. So if you pick the top k, then it will be of d by k. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. D by k is multiplied with the k by n. Okay. Sorry, d. Sorry, sir. Wait. I will tell you. So I think I'm confusing the ones who have understood all that. Okay, anyhow. <laughs> no, sir. Okay. Um, so basically, when you get this sorted eigen values, that is of size d by t, d by d. So when you just pick the top k eigen vectors, that is of size d by k. Okay. Now you're taking the transpose of this. This will be k by d. Okay. Okay. We'll write it here. So d by k is the top k eigen vectors that you picked up, where k is the number of eigen vectors and d is the dimension of each eigen vector. So now you have a zero min data which is of size n by d. Right? Take the transpose of both. So k by d multiplied with d by n. What will you get? You will get k by n. Take the transpose of this. You will get n by k. So this is the projected data. Got it, madam? So you, uh, when you compute this eigen values and eigen vectors, that is of a matrix d by d. When you just pick the top k eigen vectors, that is of size d by k. And the original data 
or after subtracting the mean from the data, you have an n by d matrix. Take the transpose of this, take the transpose of this, multiply them. You will get k by n. Once you get k by n, take the transpose of this, you will get n by k, and this is the projected data. I hope that is clear now. I didn't confuse you. So in our example, d is equivalent to 2. So you've got a 2 by 2 matrix. And you just picked up the top k eigenvector, which means the first column you picked up. That is of size 2 by 1. Right. And you have the data which is of size 10 by 2. Right. Row mean the row mean row zero mean data also. Sorry, zero mean data size also 10 by 2. Take the transpose of this. Transpose of this. 1 by 2 multiplied with 2 by 10. You will get 1 by 10. Take the transpose of this. You will get 10 by 1, which is the projected data. I mean data in the one-dimensional space. So the data in the two-dimensional space is reduced to data in the one-dimensional space. Similarly, data in the n by d dimension is reduced to n by k. Clear? I hope I did not confuse you now. Everybody? That's clear. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, fine. So, if any query, you can ask. No query? All right, then. Thank you very much. Happy learning. Okay. Thank sir, and any, happy example, any example with the uh, execution? Nothing, sir, today? Uh, tomorrow we will see, man. Okay. I mean, next Thank you, sir. we will see. Okay, sir. Because I, I'm going to explain both LDA and PCA together with comparison. Okay, no, right. no, I just want to know whether it will be there. In no, 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 not today. We'll Future. Right. Yeah, yeah, it will be there. It will be okay. there. Yes. Thank you, sir. Happy Ganesh Chaturthi, sir. And yeah, happy... yeah. Thank you very much. And same to you. Everybody, happy Ganesh Chaturthi. Thank you, sir. Same. Thank you, sir. Wish you the same. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So no class tomorrow. That's what you said, right? Okay, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.